What is going on, everybody? It's your boy, Shil Nye, and welcome to the new episode of our podcast. As usual, we got the got the normal crew together. We got Captain Coinigy. What's up, guys? We got Crypto Orangutan. What's up, guys? And we got the boy Crypto Verso. What's up, guys? Oh, and, my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone says the same thing. And today, I'm yeah. um, super, super stoked to uh, announce that we got uh, Vinny Lingham on the show today. Welcome, Vinny. How you doing? All right, great. Thanks. Uh, good to be here. Yeah, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what to expect, but let's see how it goes. Awesome. Well, Don't so worry. normally we like to start off the podcast and ask uh, the people who we're talking to how they got started in crypto and you know what their current feelings are on the market uh, now and for the future. So uh, how did you get started in crypto, Vinny? Yeah, so I started uh, in 2012, late 2012, early 2013. I started a company called Gift back in those days, and we were trying to figure out how to do um, how to do gift cards. Um, and in fact, my my passion for crypto actually go, goes back a little bit. You know, I think 2002, I was doing um, like an honors level course in, um, in e-commerce, and one of the thing, one of the the, pro the project we took was um, actually a PKI based project. And uh, so this is way back then. I thought it was very interesting. And I, I liked it. I never really obviously stayed in in in, uh, in, in crypto. But um, when the time came around, I started looking at um, at uh, Bitcoin. I, I kind of understood what you know, at least at a high level, what was happening. And I dug deeper into it. And I was pretty pretty fascinated by it. I mean, the thing for me at the time was we were we were basically building a gift card platform, and everyone would use these stolen credit cards with us all day long. So if you're selling if you're selling gift cards. And you basically issue a gift card code the moment someone gives your credit card details uh, to you, and it's a stolen card. You eat the loss. So as a as a, as a company, it was just it made no sense uh, taking credit cards. I mean, we did, and we had to just basically very few people could actually use the you use a credit card. So we would have high decline rates, etc. And then I stumbled, I stumbled upon upon Bitcoin. I was like, hang on, this is cool. So you're telling me I can like take Bitcoin from someone and instantly give them their gift card and know that it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, they can't reverse the transaction. And that was like the light bulb went off and 2013 in April, we put uh, Bitcoin into civic, uh, into gift and we quickly became one of the biggest, um, uh, you know, online retailers for, for Bitcoin. At one stage, I think we were 5% of all blockchain transactions were going through gift. And that's how we got. So we were doing, you know, I mean, in dollar terms, uh, eight figures a year, and in BTC terms, I mean, yeah, at low prices, around 100 to 200 bucks, 300 bucks, we're selling a lot of gift cards. That's awesome. Actually, I uh, have the gift app on my phone, and I've actually used it for, like, I've used it to buy gift cards with cryptocurrency, uh, whether or not it's like uh, via the app or not. But um, I, I actually have gift cards that I bought with crypto on here, so that's cool. That's um, awesome. Yeah, yeah, so, so back, back in those days, I mean, uh, TechCrunch put an article out about, you know, we, you know, we can now spend, uh, you know, you could basically spend your Bitcoins everywhere. So we were the first place that allowed you to spend Bitcoins at like 55,000 physical locations in the U.S. using Gift. Yeah, that's that's awesome for the market, um, especially, you know, getting people on there. So thank you for that, honestly. <laughs> uh, so what are your thoughts on... Um, on the market right now, and how do you think we'll fare throughout the rest of the year and maybe into 2019? Well, I think um, I think the market needs to sort of, um, you know, <laughs> look, it, it's been a very tough challenge the past you know, 12 months. We're going through, an, we, we've basically gone through another 2013 boom bust cycle, like we, we have, <laughs> and this is what I was I was warning about last year and saying, well, if we go there, it's going to be a lot worse. You're going to invoke the the governments, you're gonna, you're gonna get regulators involved, it's gonna like slow things down, all the fervor will dissipate, people are gonna lose their money, their houses, all that shit that happened in 2013 is happening on a bigger scale now. And so the panic comes in and then we go into a crypto winter for a while and then we have to rebuild and come out of it. And so I think we're, we're you know, barely halfway through that right now. And I think people are getting a taste of what 2014 was like for people who were there. Absolutely, Absolutely. yeah. yeah. So when do you respect the, uh, expect the recovery then? Because from what you're saying, if you're halfway there, I guess 2018 is going to be pretty miserable. Oh, I, I, I think we're less than halfway there personally. Um, uh, I think we can expect a period of uh, you know consolidation, and we have to find a, we have to find a bottom in the market. And I don't think we 
you know, people are saying that, uh, you know, after we hit the double bottom last time, that was a double bottom. I'm like, now we're back down there and we're looking to test it again. And if it breaks the 5,700 level, it's going to be pandemonium and chaos and we could go a lot lower. So, like, nobody knows. Maybe maybe we maybe we bounce off 5,700 and we have a triple bottom and then it goes back up. No one knows, right? We're in uncharted territory right now. But the, mm. the fundamental mechanics of the market are not good. I think a lot of people would agree with you on that. So you're certainly not alone. And, and like l last year, people, you know, people were laughing at me when I was, I was, I wrote a blog post about trying to prevent a bubble. And I was like, guys, this, the, you know, the split's really bad for Bitcoin. We shouldn't have two Bitcoins. We shouldn't have chart two, two, six, basically hash pile on two different chains. Cause you know, when things go the other way, it's going to be bad. If you look at the situation we're in right now, we had a situation where all the shock to physics hash power could only sit on one chain. Now it can go to another chain. So in the crypto winter 2014, miners had no choice. They had to basically mine Bitcoin or turn their equipment off. Now they can go and mine a different chain. They can mine Bitcoin Cash if it's more profitable on the day. And so you're going to have this, you have the risks of, you know, 51% of tax coming in, etc. And so we've got a lot of like security risks that come in as the price of Bitcoin drops. I and mean, I tweeted out yesterday that. Bitcoin's, you know, the, the economic risks, uh, the economic um, attack surface of Bitcoin hasn't really been tested yet, and it's about to be, I think, if the price keeps dropping. So, these are these are risks that were pointed out, but you know, in the fervor and the sort of greed of the market, we just kind of ignored, and we think that this keeps going up forever. It doesn't. So, do you think that there's some maybe critical point where there's some just total collapse? Like, if the price drops below here, then you know, all hope is lost, or well, it's not about all hope being lost. I think everyone believes in the long-term future of Bitcoin or of crypto. Uh, let's just be frank, the 95% of cryptos are going to fail because they don't find product market fit. Nobody uses them or they're scams or combination of all of that. Uh, you know, and, and uh, there'll be a few winners. And so in the, in the non-Bitcoin space, you're going to have, um, you know, I, I struggle to see more than 100, 150 real coins out there that people can use. Uh, and then you'll have a long tail of like small stuff, which is just scammy and useless. Uh, but you know, not, nothing in crypto ever goes to zero. I think BitConnect took like a week or two or whatever it is before we eventually went to zero. Um, Still not at zero, actually. People really? Trading oh. that for a couple yeah. bucks. Yeah, like <clears throat> pumps and dumps. <laughs> yeah, there you go. C case I'm bullish. Point. Case in point. Yep. Yeah. So, so I, I think we're gonna be. Um, there's going to be a shakeout, and I think it needs to happen. And we're going to go into crypto bear market, which every single market has a bear market. They go, you know, hand in hand. And so, how long will this bear market be? I think everyone thought it'd be a short bear market. Um, I think it's actually. I'm very glad it's looking to be a longer one because I think it's healthy for the ecosystem. Um, and there's a couple of key things I'm looking for. I'm looking for, you know, a lot more of the scams to be washed out. There's a couple of, you know, Ponzi schemes I've been eyeing for a while that I'm waiting for them to, to shake out. And only when these things start to happen, then we can, you know, clean up and move forward. Awesome. Cool. I dig it. I dig it. Well, I mean, since we're talking about the longevity of, of different cryptocurrencies and things like that, you know, um, I checked out Civic and I've been, I've been looking into Civic. Ever since we met out in uh, out in New York City in that uh, that little yacht party for Jack's wallet, um, and I don't know, I've just been curious. So, what what inspired you to create Civic? Like, what's the what's what was your vision behind it, and what what solution did or what problem did you see in the world that needed this solution? So, you know, when I was at GIF, one of the biggest problems was credit card purchases, right? So we had the problem, that, and the banks would tell us, well, you know, you've got a card not not present purchase, which is going to be uh, reversed. I'm like, well, what do you mean card not present? Well, you know, it's not there. The guys over the internet using it, how you know it's him. Well, I'm like, well, the card was kind of present. Well, then the number was there. The card is a form factor. So we have the number, but we don't know it's the real person. So that's the, the issue. It's like a, actually a person not present problem, not a card not present, because it's not really a card, it's a form factor. Anyway, so like having, you know, having that insight. Then the second thing is I grew up in South Africa back in the you know, apartheid days and when Nelson Mandela became president in 94, it's just, it was crazy to witness people spending two, three days in line trying to vote and exercise the democratic rights uh, in an election. And economically, they didn't, have, they didn't have three days to spend in line. People had to bring them food and water and like it was just a, I mean, it was a very celebratory time for the country, but like it wasn't a very... Um, yeah, it was very like to see even the U.S. I mean, to, like stand in lines and you know voting booths and polls and like, and when I had to vote in the last South African election, 
you know, a couple of years ago. I had to fly to LA. I didn't do it in the end, but I would have to go fly to LA, stand in line at the embassy. It's ridiculous. So why can't we just vote online? And so I, I started digging into voting online. And the, 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 one of the key use cases for, for blockchain and, and Bitcoin, we started specific, was, hey, can we buy a voting platform? Can we do do this in such a way that every single vote's like a coin? It's unique. It goes to an address. You can tabulate the votes in real time. There's no double counting. There's no you know crazy stuff. And that was like the original thesis for Civic. So we started building that. We started, well, I'd say investigating that. We wrote a business plan for it. We never actually pitched to anyone because after spending time speaking to regulators and governments and whatever else, the the one thing became very apparent that they, they thought in terms of like five and 10 year cycles for this sort of thing. And there's no way a startup can like have those sorts of, of, of cycles to test up, test the market. And and secondly, they just don't trust devices. They were like, well, how do I know it's the same person using the phone? So then we kind of said, okay, well, hang on, maybe we should be focusing on building an identity layer, which people can trust. The people know that Vinny, you know, person not present, but we know it's Vinny authenticated on there's private keys, there's a facial recognition, there's a selfie or there's a touch ID or something. So we, we built a, a layer where we basically abstracted biometric authentication away from uh, key, key holding and ownership and away from in, uh, personal data. So we kind of put those three things together into different layers in our stack and you can essentially uh, build a decentralized identity platform where everyone stores their own personal data, has their biometrics on their device securely in, housed in, uh, in secure elements and and whatnot, depending on what device they're using, and then be able to authenticate using you know, zero knowledge proofs to uh, com you know, confirm certain bits of information about themselves. But the more important thing is like by decentralizing information and having it not sitting in one central database, you you can avoid like the Experian and Equifax type hacks where everyone's information gets stolen and sold on the dark web. So that's in short what we're doing. We're trying to solve that problem. And uh, as a you know, step one, we at consensus we we launched a good example where you can just prove that you're 21 to a vending machine and get a beer. And that was pretty popular. Um, <clears throat> about that uh, vending machine, I was just wondering. <laughs> technically, um, couldn't let's say I had a, an older brother and I really wanted a beer, and he had um, his identity verified with Civic on the app, and he wanted to help me out. Could I not take his phone and scan the code and then get a beer myself using his like kind of credentials? Yeah. So you can also you know get him to go to you know a liquor store and buy you a beer as well. That works. Equally well, they're both illegal, <laughs> but that's true. <laughs> but yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great answer, actually. All right, so um, here's a slightly different question. But do you do you do you like trade um, in you know the sense of the word of how everyone is you know on Binance or KuCoin or whatever and do you, you know, participate in exchanges? And if so, what, what uh, kinds of coins do you trade? Do you only trade uh, the large cap coins or do you dabble in mid cap and low caps? What's your style? I, I trade for learning and, and trying out platforms. I, I mean, I trade obviously, I, I've, done, I've done, I did trading from, you know, in different part, different sort of times. I, I'm really busy, obviously. So trading is something which, unless you're doing it full time, you can't really do it often. So. I mean, I was trading in December because it was kind of like downtime and the market was going nuts. And uh, that was interesting. But I'm more of a long-term sort of buy and hold guy. And I'll trade, um, you know, at, at spot points uh, in time. But I've done a lot of trading in the past. Um, and, I, you know, but I, I don't, I'm not a day trader per se. It's, it's, it's too time consuming. Now, that said, we do, uh, I joined a fund called Multicoin Capital. And we do have a very large portfolio that's traded. But we, again, we're not day traders. We take positions, we get in and out sometimes, and it's all depending on market conditions. But uh, you know, it's a significant size fund, and I'm one of the three general partners um, on the fund. All right. Uh, I have a small question. Please don't take it the wrong way. But uh, are you aware that whenever you do a prediction in Twitter, there are like a lot of biggest traders, like crypto Twitter traders, uh, treating you know, like your predictions as counter trading indicators, like whatever you say, we are going down, they are going long, and the opposite happens as well. I hope they've been doing a lot lately. I mean, I hope they like on my last tweet last month where I said nine thousand was we had to hold nine thousand. I hope they went all in with everything they've got. At <laughs> <laughs> like because you know it's it's fine. Like if, do your own research. If you're gonna use me as a counter indicator and put your whole stack behind me. And when I say, and I saw some guys tweeting it out when I said nine thousand, they were like, 
time to go all in, boys. Everything's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. And, now, and now we're at sixty five hundred. So if, if that's your strategy, then don't like fight with me. <laughs> you, you lost your. How shirt. do you deal with those sort of people, like the trolls on Twitter? Just block them. Do you troll them back? No, no, I block. I actually have a big block list. I have fifteen hundred blocks, and I, know. I block all. The, I mean, people say you know. People thought honestly, like I don't mind people being, you know, like having engaging and, you know, and but the moment you're rude, the moment you're sort of um, insulting or like, you know, or you just, you know, I basically I have a very very loose block finger because like life's too short. I've got too many followers. I block less than one percent of all my followers, so I don't really mind. You know, if it's as, like one percent. If, if I was blocking more than one percent, I'd be I'd be concerned. But I think at least if, <laughs> at least one percent of my followers have got to be a bunch of jerks. So like I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm probably getting at least seventy five percent of all my blocks right. Have you got any like one particular troll DM that stands out that made you laugh? It was so like trolly. Dude, there's no way one stands out. I've got so many. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but 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 seriously, like there's a lot of like there's a lot of stupid shit. Like at, at seventeen thousand, at nineteen thousand, people were giving me shit like, "Oh, Vinny, what are you uh, like?" Uh, I, I don't know. P people don't realize like. It's uh, <laughs> the, nobody knows my positions. So, so how do you like? I, I don't understand how people go like, "Oh, Vinny's crying right now about his positions," and <laughs> like he and they get it wrong. Eh? Like some people go, "Vinny sold everything at two thousand. No, I never said that. Vinny like never bought back. No, I never said that either. Like they they, they, they like make up shit. Like it's just it's ridiculous how people. Um, they just like there's no fact checking on anything. You just like whatever you hear from your buddy or in a chat room, you go and you go and blast me on Twitter, and I'm like, this is like I can't help stupidity. Like there's no cure for it. I, I, I really like you know, I, I wish there was because I, I think I, that every single <laughs> one of us can relate to that state. Yeah. <laughs> Crypto Twitter. I mean, that's what. Are those the type of people you're hoping to shake out with the bear market? <laughs> if I told if I told people like if, if put it this way, if people actually saw my 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 trades and. Actually, like they would be a little bit more like, oh shit, okay, hang on, we got this wrong. But I like I'm not discussing, I'm not showing you my my, my trades. I'm like the and even honestly, like you guys know, if, if you did 10x on, if you got in to Bitcoin at like a buck, oh uh, sorry, at like a, a thousand bucks at the start of the year, and you managed to time the top and get out of twenty thousand, which no one would have done, you would have done twenty x. Okay, maybe a little bit more. Okay. The reality is the median probably the median person trading Bitcoin who got in in January, February, March, uh, you know, first quarter of the year probably maybe maybe took five x off the table, maybe ten. You know, because you're not going to get rid of your whole stash. So if, if you did five or ten x last year, then you did really well if you got on top. And like, and quite frankly, when you look at the altcoin market, five or ten x is nothing. Yeah, it's nothing. It was a joke. So like the, the, the Bitcoin guys were going on about like, oh, well, Bitcoin's up. I mean, no, Bitcoin's up 5X, 6X. Well, there are a lot of altcoins where 20, 30, 50, 100X was kind of like the order of the day. So it, it wouldn't be like going and insulting people who said they sold Bitcoin before the alt, you know, the alt bubble happened and got in and out of that one in time. Like, but this is my, my point is not worth discussing it because like, whatever. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the scams that need to be washed out, uh, and I wanted to ask about the current ICO market because we get like, I don't know, 10, 20 ICOs a day, two free listings on IDEX a day, and a bunch of these ICOs trying to raise like 40, 50 million, even if they don't need it. It's like, it's obvious that it is such oversaturated right now, but how do you see the ICO market acting in like next few months? Like, are people st are gonna st just stop investing in the ICOs or uh, are they gonna go uh, fully private sales? How do you see them going forward? Well, first of all, let's not talk about how much money is being raised in USD terms because that's a bit of a red herring. People don't raise USD, they raise Ether and they raise BTC and maybe some other less liquid currencies. So you know, the, the conversion number is wrong because that fiat does not exist in the system. It's fake money, right? It's only yeah. real money when you sell it for fiat. Do you, does everyone agree with that? Yeah, but a lot of them will sell it straight after it ends to kind of. Oh no, no, no! If, you, if you're tracking the wallets of the of the ICOs, uh, that's not the case. I, can, I, I track the wallets. I can tell you now that's not the case. Yeah, I guess it depends. Yeah. So, so go track the go, go track the wallets of the top thousand ICOs and see how much is left in there. A lot. 
Exactly. So, yeah. so, so, and a lot of it's ether. So ether is probably going to be the, 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 you know, ether is going to take a lot of the pain on the way down. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been happening like the uh, recently when uh, ether ether was dumping. Yeah. There were some movements on the ICO wallets that uh, teams yeah. were actually dumping some of them because they were afraid it would literally dump too. So, so, so I, I'm going to write this up in a blog post, hopefully this weekend. But I'll give you guys a hint of what I'm what I'm what of some numbers, okay? So how, how many companies do you think there are in the, the, the crypto ecosystem worldwide right now? Well, what do you mean by company? Because there's uh, lots of like, projects. you know, ideas, uh, projects, probably like 2,000? So, so projects and, and when I say companies, projects and companies and entities, okay? So let's just call it, uh, collectively, let's say, how many groups of individuals that have got tokens raised and and funded, etc. The, the the number's probably close to five thousand. Five thousand, interesting. Okay, well, worldwide, worldwide. If you break the numbers down, it's closer to five thousand. How many employees or, or, or team members contributing roughly to each one? You think there are? It's, it's probably around fifty thousand, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Average yeah. N of each so, one. So, sorry, so so, so so ten so ten employees per project, roughly fifty thousand people worldwide, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. Yes, I, I think it's a fair. Like when I go to these conferences, there's eight thousand people at a conference, or nine thousand people. That's you know, I, I would find it hard to believe that that's more than twenty percent of the entire you know uh, crypto world at a conference. Does everyone agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's say fifty thousand people is a is a minimum number. The average salaries in crypto, if you look at engineers and everyone else, the minimum right now is probably a hundred thousand dollars a year, right? Okay. Per and person or per project? Per person, per person, annual salary, eight thousand dollars a month. I mean, we look, we look at what we, we you know, what, what developers are being getting, being paid for around the world, etc. That, and that's on the low end. And so you bring in a couple of admin people, social media people, etc. But you, you probably get a hundred thousand would be a very nice low average, right? Sure, sure, makes sense. Okay, how much do you think that is per year? Well, if it's a hundred thousand times fifty thousand people, that's. Um... Ooh, I'm bad at math. Probably like five hundred million. The five billion. Five billion. Uh, one zero. Okay. So, so now let's 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 go through the math here. Okay, five billion dollars. How much money do you think is flowed into crypto in terms of fiat to support a three hundred billion market cap over the past five, seven, the quarter, nine years in total? So the best estimates I've seen is an upper bound of about thirty to forty billion. Okay, that's over a very long period of time. So, like, let's look at the monthly numbers. How much money do you guys think goes into mining every month? Mining costs. Oh, I, I, that's not a question to ask me. I'm not yeah, sure. I'll, I'll tell you. So, it's roughly two hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin needs to be sold every single month. Two hundred million needs to be sold from miners to pay the cost, yeah, of mining. Okay. Now, it's not, it's not evenly spaced every day. I mean, you know, some of them will hold or whatever else, but that's the total cost of electricity and. Uh, and everything else for for Bitcoin right now, R roughly, roughly two hundred million. Okay, makes sense. About eight million dollars a day. Think about it. the mining world is eight million dollars a day. Sounds about right, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's we, we can do the math quickly on block reward. So let's say so it's uh, twelve point five. Um, let's do the math quickly. Equals twelve point five times uh, six times twenty four times sixty five hundred. Call it that. Okay, at the current price, it's a hundred and sorry, and that is that's three, four. Okay, so times it times about thirty. Um, so three hundred sorry, three hundred fifty-one million dollars a month. Three hundred fifty-one million dollars a month. Yeah, so I'm I'm just off there. Yep, yeah, fifty-one. Just yeah. selling Bitcoin. That's oh, hold, on, hold on, hold on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My bad, my bad. That's the total revenue. So if you look at the margins that miners are having, which is roughly. You know, I'd say 65, 70 percent is probably about right. Um, that's the, so that's the the, the cost. The, the margin is 30 percent, so the cost is about 70 percent mm -hmm. across the board. 245 million. So let's call it 200 for argument's sake, or even 225. Okay, we're around about there. Okay, so it's, it's between 200, 250 million dollars. Do you realize the human capital cost of supporting the, the crypto ecosystem right now is double that of the mining of Bitcoin alone? So there's so there's obviously some kind of you know mismatch here between the two, which is Correct. not clearly not healthy for the system. Correct. So now you've got a situation where you've got 
250 million dollars roughly 250 million plus another 400 million dollars in human capital costs because none of these companies make any profits right these projects are all not profitable there's no revenues coming in okay so right. so in order to support the ecosystem 650 million dollars worth of crypto has to be sold just to support bitcoin mining and the people forget the mining of ethereum and everything else just those two 650 million what do you think the net buying is per month is it net buying or net selling? Do you think there's net buyers or sellers? Because you can't pay your bills with, with, with crypto. So you've got to sell your coins into BTC or into ETH and in from ETH and BTC into fiat. So every month there's a net deficit of, of fiat coming in the system because we're not, there isn't, I, I don't believe there's 650 million plus of new money flowing into crypto every month, especially in a down cycle like this. Okay. So do you think that all of the employees who are working on these crypto projects are not, are, are only getting fiat or do you think that some of them are being paid in crypto it doesn't matter their living costs are probably in the order of call it even hard i mean most people living costs call it 80 percent of their salaries right so you're saving 20 percent. you still have to pay your salary somehow so you got to sell the fiat okay that's and fair this, enough this so even if it was only 80 percent of that number there's still a significant deficit this is my point even at 80 percent of the number i mean and by the way like <laughs> i'm being conservative on these numbers right so 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 right now you've got a, you've got net sellers per day in Bitcoin in crypto. If, if, honestly, if you add the mining in for Ethereum and everything else, you're looking at over three hundred million, three fifteen million probably for the rest of crypto mining costs, etc. So, so how does this issue resolve itself? So you, you you basically have to find an equilibrium point, and so the equilibrium point here is one where um, the amount of, of of new buying or new fiat coming into the system is equal to the amount of fiat selling in the system. And so right now you have a massive imbalance. There's not enough buying coming in and there's too much selling happening at the same time. So guess what happens? The prices have to decompress until all the ETH is, is effectively sold. All these companies either go bankrupt or shut down or these projects end or whatever it is, or people start making money or they start adding real value to society. So money has to flow in. So people right. come in and buy tokens for projects that actually have real services that the real world needs. Because the only way you're going to get money flowing to the system is having real world companies and governments buying tokens to use for utility purposes or whatever else. But right. the store of value hypothesis is bullshit if you've got this sort of drain on fiat in the, in the short term. And by the way, as the price comes down, you have to sell more fiat to get the same, more, uh, more crypto to get the same amount of fiat out of the system. So this becomes basically a downward spiral. That makes yeah. sense. So. Yeah. One of the solutions, if, correct me if I'm wrong, could be some like there's just too many projects in the space. Is is, is that one, one of the big issues that you see? That's correct. And well, I the, think that's something we've definitely touched on. In fact, that I think most people here think that you know 90 percent, 95 percent of the projects out there are you know bullshit. So yeah, but they're yeah, gonna they're, they're gonna sell the crypto first anyway. So the crypto has to be sold. I mean, right. they're, they're not gonna shut down until the crypto is all gone. Yep. That's why I was surprised by your what you said earlier. You said only about 100, 150 projects will survive. Don't you think it'll be a lot less than that? No, I think, I think look, the, the, honestly, it's probably a couple of hundred. It's probably like you know, 200 or 300 will survive. Remember, you've also got regions. You've got parts of the world where they're not going to use uh, Civic, for example, because the government, like, I don't know, wants them to use a proprietary government platform and there'll be a token for that or something. Like, there's just, there, there, there are places that there isn't, you know, you know, the world doesn't, the world isn't full of free market economies. There's lots of like regimes and stuff. So you can't, mm -hmm. you can't assume that, that one token will rule the world. And I mean, some countries, Bitcoin's going to be, I, I, I guarantee you the next 12 to 18 months, there'll be a, a country where uh, receiving a Bitcoin payment and not declaring it to the government will be deemed illegal and criminally you know, you'll be put in jail for it because people are using it to avoid taxes right now. So if you're a developer working in an emerging market or any other part of the world, you're, it's very easy for you to get companies offshore to pay you to do code in Bitcoin. You put it on a ledger and there's no taxes being paid. When the government starts figuring this out, they're going to start making it illegal for that to happen because they're not getting the tax revenues. Right. Yep. Makes sense. So there's definitely some things that need to be done before we see another real bull season, especially considering how the governments are more active, uh, you know, in regulation and whatnot. So yeah, the, the market has to the market has to find a natural bottom. You have to find equilibrium between buyers and sellers. So 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 I think we're getting to a point right now where there's just the order books are dry. If you look at how much if you look at how much a, a ten million dollar order will flood the order books and how how much slippage there is right now, there's no liquidity out there. Even the OTC desks are struggling a little bit because there's just the, the, the lack of buyers. So guess what? If people have bills to pay, and quite frankly, 
at 500, 600, 700 million dollars a month in fiat requirements for the system to keep functioning because people don't live in crypto world, they live in the real world, that money is going to drain the system. And so the system is already coming under pressure. So you're going to have this seesaw effect, you know, there'll be like a, you know, high, uh, lower highs and then lower lows all the way down. I don't know where the bottom is. I mean, it could be 5,700, maybe that's the number, but it's very hard to track how much new money is going into crypto. And especially when you have a downward spiral like this, it, it, no one wants to put no one wants to catch a falling knife. Right, right, yeah. yeah. So, so um, talking so about- Anyway, so, so having, having said all that, that uh, and. Do you guys still think I'm a, I'm a great uh, counter indicator? I mean, no, obviously you're very educated. I, mean, I think it's just a yeah. meme, to be honest. Yeah. Like, no, but if I, if I am, you should be buying the market up right now and helping everyone else get up. <laughs> I went all in while we were in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, as there are talking about there being a lot of projects, um, there's quite a few different projects that have a similar use case as Civic. For example, TKY, the key or self key. I know that the key are kind of focusing more on the Asian market. Are you trying to like use Civic everywhere or are you going to like share the pie or are you going for the whole thing? We, we are, we, well, from that? we're building an open platform. So anyone who wants to participate in the marketplace that we're building can participate in it. We're, we're building a marketplace guys. It's like, it's like an eBay for identity. It's a marketplace. People plug in buyers and sellers and use our platform. They can build their own apps. They can do whatever they want. That's what we're building. We're, we're, it's totally independent. We, we, you know, we don't really care what our competitors are doing. That if they can build liquidity in their marketplace, then maybe we, our marketplaces can connect. If they're not building a marketplace, maybe they should use ours. At the end of the day, we think that liquidity is what's going to drive this market forward. So we, we're trying to make sure that it's the most open, most liquid marketplace um, out there. Uh, we, we're also building consumer use cases. So guess what? When you buy that beer uh, from a vending machine, there's a, you know, whatever, 25 cents going to Civic Tokens to pay for the transaction. That's great. That's a real use case. If we can sell 100 million beers, a year or a billion beers a year through vending machines, that's money, right? So so this is my point. Like, if there's real utility for the tokens, they'll be consumed. And so consumptive demand is what's going to drive the value of these tokens up uh, over the long term. So companies need to build and projects need to think about what's going to drive demand and usage. Yeah, it's great to have governments doing, you know, all sorts of things which take five years. But in the short term, you know, I'd rather get 100,000 vending machines out in the streets and people buying beers. Like, it's just... I'm trying to be practical about how do we actually drive usage of these tokens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, you met Shil Nye at Consensus. I so did. was there was there any like favorite project or what was your favorite part about Consensus? And maybe one project you didn't even know existed that really caught your eye. Um, honestly, Consensus was just you know, information overload. Um, I. Uh, <laughs> I got to I got to meet with the, the Metasert guys, which I really liked. Uh, Metasert's doing some really cool. If you're in a Telegram room that's using Metasert, when people uh, post like scammy and spammy links, uh, those uh, their bot automatically tells you about that. So that obviously ties into like what we're doing with identity. So I like what Metasert's doing to help clean up the web because there's a lot of spam, a lot of scams, a lot of phishing links, etc. Uh, that that stood out as one of the you know went to the party as well. That was a good one. Um, uh, so I'll give a shout out to them. And uh, honestly, everything else I've seen so far is just kind of either me too or like there's no real use case. There's, it's just people kind of like, I, I think people focus the conference too much on trying to raise money from investors. I mean, we were focusing on giving away free beers. Like, hey, yes, <laughs> use our tokens. So Genius we're, marketing. Well, exactly. It was like, get out there and people can use this. Like, I don't want your money. We've got enough tokens. Thank you. But here's a free beer. <laughs> and it, it worked. Okay, so yeah. I got a, I got a small question uh, next to it. Uh, when we interviewed uh, McAfee, he said that all the basically, according to him, all the advisors or most of them on many ICOs are absolutely like worthless. They do nothing outside of just getting money and shining with their names. And I know that you are also an advisor on fruit projects. And if you could talk about what is your role on those projects that you are advising on. And what do you think about like the majority of other advisors on those popular ICOs? Do they really mean mean something, or is it basically only a marketing tool to get more money out of the investors? Yeah, I do very few advisor roles, uh, relatively speaking. Anyway, I mean, I've got I've got ones, very few new ones per year. They kind of they kind of add up over time because <laughs> we do like three or four a year, and I've been doing this for like I've been doing advisory work for companies for like eight years. So it's probably like in the thirties now, but I only do a few a year. The ones I really like. Um, I can almost guarantee you that every company I've 
been an advisor to. Uh, they've always said, like, whenever they need help, we need anything, I'm, I'm happy to help. And it's, you know, I, I think the, the role of an advisor changes over time, depending on what stage the company is at. I think uh, the, the, I agree that a lot of advisors are just useless, absolutely useless. I, I try not to be one of those advisors. So I try to give good advice, and you know, um, I, 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 you can basically ask any company I'm advising, and, and we, you know, we have ID codes coming out soon, which will you know, allow you to see all the companies I advise and verify the relationships, etc. But um, you know, like Hilo, for example, and um, uh, a few others. But uh, you know, the point is that um, I've been very helpful with you know, every, everything from helping them raise money to helping them solve product market fit issues, go to market, hiring. Wherever I can now, the thing about the thing about advisory from my perspective is is what I I try to do is if I become an advisor, it's really an endorsement of the entrepreneurs, the project, the team, etc. Because like I'm not going to go in. I, I've received guys. I've received offers of like a half a million dollars to advise a company, which I just thought was like, okay, this, this is not going to work, or, or I don't trust the entrepreneurs or whatever else. So so the the way I look at it is. If you see me as an advisor, it's an endorsement that this is not a scam. I can't yeah. guarantee that they will solve the problems they're trying to solve and they'll win and get product market fit and become a billion dollar company. But it's not a scam. The entrepreneurs are smart. They're, they're, they're you know they're trying hard. They've got uh, a good team built up. They've got a good vision. They've got good people supporting them around them, etc. I'm there to help them if they need it uh, when they need it. I you know so so that's really what in my, in my mind like. There probably should be a delineation between an endorser and an advisor in the crypto world, but uh, I think that's really what it is for me. I think if you want, if you want to expect your advisors to do all the work, that's just not going to happen. Uh, advisors are there to advise, and it's very ad hoc. And I tell all the companies I advise, it's on demand, and it's something which you earn. You don't pay for. Well, at least with me, I don't need money, so I don't like you know the money is irrelevant. So you can offer me ten million dollars if you're going to destroy my reputation. I'm going to say no. Or if I think you're a scam and you're trying to steal money from people, I'm going to say no. So it's not about that. But equally, I, I'm running a company. I don't have the time to advise you on every step of the way. I can help you speak to the right people. Or I can help you, you know, meet the right connections, etc. But it's more important that there's some endorsement that you're not a scam, and and I'll help you where I can on demand. Don't sit back and expect me to come to you every day with your advice. When you um, release these ID codes, you know, for ICOs, see if advisors are fake and et cetera, et cetera, will you, will the companies have to come to you and pay for that or will it be? For, for now, that's totally free and I, I don't think we'll be charging for companies to use um, ID codes at all. Okay, cool. Because yeah. I know there's another company called ClearPoll. The way they get people to use their tokens is they actually make the companies or ICOs pay them to verify the projects, but you're going to be free, so that's, that's yeah, awesome. we're going to be free. So, so, so remember the, the way that the, the marketplace works is the, the money is made on uh, verifications to the marketplace. So the more people are using it, there's the more the more that you know, it's when someone gets ID identified the first time. Um, when it comes to like you know displaying your ID or relationship stuff, we just I mean there's no real cost involved, so why would we charge for that? Yeah. Uh, we got a quick question from the from the people in the chat. Uh, what happens if uh, SEC declares uh, Ethereum as security? Uh, what will be the outcome of that? I was in the list. Yeah, guys, I, like I can't. I, I actually can't speak uh, speak about things that the SEC could or could not do. So I'm going to avoid that question because I just don't think it's something which um, which I'm qualified to um, to answer on. But I do know that um, you are confident, though, because I read in the Bitcoin magazine, you said we looked at the way security sales are done and we did the opposite of everything they did. So that's exactly right. So that's what I can say. So, so I can say that we we didn't give anyone discounts. Not a single person got a discount, not an investor, not an advisor, not myself, nobody. I didn't even buy any tokens. So uh, like literally we did the cleanest one we could possibly imagine. No one got discounts. We had the white, you know, when an investment, let me tell you how a security sold. The investment bank goes to their best customers, gives them all discounts. It's held by like 50 or 100 entities or people. And then they offer it everywhere else. The price goes up and everyone offloads on them and makes profit. And that's how they do it. <laughs> so you, if you go in last, you're, you're, you know, you're, the, you're, you're the bag holder. Um, with, with what we did was we opened this up to you know, 10,000 people. We had 50,000 people on the queue trying to buy. We had caps and limits on everyone, how much they could spend. Nobody got discounts. It was a very fair, well-run process. Uh, we did the exact opposite of how you would sell security. 
cool. Well, that's good to hear. Well, jumping back to like the topic around entrepreneurs and stuff, uh, I saw you're on Shark Tank South Africa, which is pretty cool. Shark Tank's uh, used to be one of my favorite shows um, when I was uh, really first getting started in the entrepreneurial world. Um, so I guess my question is like, what's your favorite part about that? Do you find a lot of uh, companies on that on there that you really uh, are intrigued in, and, and uh, yeah, anything you regret passing on? So definitely no regrets on passing on anything there. I think I did a good job of that. The, but the one I really liked the most was the one I invested on called Augmentors. I did the first ever Bitcoin deal on one of the Shark Tanks worldwide. So I was the first shark to invest in Bitcoin. So I invested in Bitcoin on the show with them. I think Bitcoin was like 500 bucks at the time or whatever it was. So we invested in Bitcoin. We did a, we did an ICO for them in January of last year. And the, uh, they launched the Databits uh, token. And it's the, the product's coming out, uh, I think, later this year. Um, it's looking amazing. I'm really, really excited about what these guys are doing. I think you can find the clip online. You should go find the clip online. But um, on the website, you, go, you, you can see the clip where I invested on the show. And I, I like literally just two guys in a room with this like, crazy idea for an AR. Uh, it's kind of like a, a, a Pokemon Go type you know, game, AR game where you like, but, you know, but it's more all tokenized. So the, the, the creatures are tokenized. They're going to be using... Um, uh, they got relics and creatures. It's a really, really cool graphics and stuff and design and the gameplay looks good. I mean, you never know games, how they go. But like, there's an example of like first ever Bitcoin deal on, on Shark Tank and these guys are executing and it'll be, it'll be out pretty soon. Yeah, I was actually investing in this last year during the summer a lot. It, uh, right. it got a lot of uh, people mad because it never, never actually mooned as they expected. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know what? That's fine because, like, we've de we've designed the game economy and the game uh, token economy. People should actually pay attention to the the work that's gone in here because once the game goes live and people start playing it, if the game really takes off, there's we built the economy that it's, it, it'll respond to it. And my my partner from Utah Partners, um, you know, Lou, sits on the board here. So again, trust you know, I, I, like I trust the team. I trust what they're doing. I'm happy to endorse them. I'm an investor in the company. I bought tokens in the sale, etc. So like. I'm I'm excited about what uh, these guys are doing, and then this is a great use case for for blockchain, right? You get to tokenize, and you, you basically it's like this is like CryptoKitties effectively, but with a real game coming out. Yeah, it is. I mean, the project really looks looks cool. I mean, the only reason people were mad because it was literally a very long roadmap. Yeah, but, uh, the, but the project, the game itself, looks looks really fine. I'm uh, excited to see how this will end up. And they do a great job in communicating the roadmap to people. I mean, to build a, uh, like for a small team, I think it's like ten or twelve guys to build a an AR high graphic intensive game like this. It doesn't you can't do it in twelve months. Like let's be realistic. And so they, they they're building this up, and it's I think it's going to be a, a a very like I think it's going to be a fun game to play. I'm looking forward to it. Um, we have another question in the YouTube comments. Someone asked, Vinny, how can we decouple Bitcoin alts pairing? Because uh, whenever Bitcoin goes down, good alts like Civic also go down too. So obviously, what, what do you think about that? I think it's pretty obvious. So, so that, 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 the, the answer is easier. It's easier said than done. I mean, the, the, the decoupling comes when obviously there's the, the mechanical decoupling, which means that you have to have pairs trading. Um, the second thing is you have to have liquidity for these for these alts, which makes the demand. So so think about this: the real world demand for an alt would would outpace the um, the what, example. I'll, I'll simplify things. If we had a, and a lo lot of these guys, a lot of these good, um, uh, a lot of these, these 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 companies out there have been trying to do this. Putting gold on the blockchain is a good example, right? If you had one token linked to an, an ounce of gold, for example, at 1000 call it $300. You think, that, you think the Bitcoin price tank, the price of gold tokens would tank? I, I couldn't tell you. No, they couldn't. Like, it's, it's impossible, right? If Bitcoin went down 20%, the price of gold tokens are not going to go from 1300 down 20%, 1100 or so. It's, it's not going to happen, 11, mm -hmm. 10, 40. Okay. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know about that, though. No, 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 no. I'll, are... tell why. I'll tell you why. Well, because... wait, wait, no, 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 no. Before you say oh, that, there's tokens right now that exist, like Dignity, ORME, that are backed by gold right now. And they they don't, you know, they're not they're not perfect. They don't stay no, with no, the no. value of gold. No, no, no. So, so the, the only issue is counterparty risk. 
if you know for a fact that the gold is sitting in a vault and you can redeem those tokens for gold, the biggest odd play in the world would be to basically buy up gold up to the $1,300 price or whatever it is, the, the spot price, and then deliver the gold effectively or deliver the tokens to someone. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so my, my point is, you know, the, because gold is strongly coupled to the real world economy, a gold token would not trade at the same volatility as, a, as, a, as, as Bitcoin does, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the same reason why Tether is 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 sitting at a, at a buck, right? Because well, the market believes that there is a dollar for every Tether out there. So and they, and there's a redemption mechanism for them to to, to execute that. So there are ways of redeeming through through uh, the to, the tokens to Tether. So that's why it doesn't drop below a buck, right? But if if for example the money wasn't there, it would drop. So so I I guess what you're essentially implying here is that the biggest um, the biggest thing that we need to figure out is, at least in that case, is the counterparty risk and eliminating that. Yeah, well, counterparty risk is one part of it. The, the, the other part of it is when you take it when you take a token and it has no real world demand. Like in other words, no one will pay USD for it uh, or any other currency. Then it's a problem. Second is what is utility? Well, everyone goes, "Oh, it's a utility token." Utility means that the value of the, that, that the usage for it doesn't change with the price. So if you need to, you need one civic token for an ID verification or whatever it is, you still need that one token, even if the price goes up and down. The the store of value hypothesis only works if the price is going up, okay? Or the, and so so the, this is like the issue I have with, with the Bitcoin sort of you know maximalist, which I used to be one of. It's like the the, uh, your, the thesis only works on an upward price from trajectory. What happens when it's volatile? What happens when the price is going down? Well, then you try and expand the time horizon and say, well, think ten years. That's great. How do we get there? In the short term, it's difficult to get there, right? Because it's an emotional, you know, we're not robots. <laughs> right. So, so how do you get past that? So store of value kind of makes sense on like 100-year time horizons, but on short-term time horizons, it doesn't make sense. And so when you're building a utility token, like put it this way, if I told you that we had hypothetically a million beer machines out there and they each require, I don't know, 100 million civic tokens every year to function that have to go in and out of the market, guess what? There's enough consumptive demand for those tokens that the bottom can't fall out of the market because these people, consumers are out there. They have no idea there's a token in the background. They're spending this money on beers. Every time they buy a beer, a token gets used, right? So, like hypothetically, if there's a if if, if the demand for a token is anchored in the real world and there's utility for that, then what happens? The, the, there's price support. So if Bitcoin can tank, but no one's going to be like, well, let's you know short the uh, you know, token that has real utility because. It, you know, you need to buy those tokens. There's there's consumptive demand for those tokens. Hmm. Fair enough. <clears throat> that makes sense. So right now we're in the early stage of a speculative mania because nobody knows what the demand is going to be like for any of these tokens that are out there. And right. so, so there's no real world demand. So in Bitcoin tanks, everything else tanks because there's nothing to support it. Yeah, I think that's actually one really important market phase that we haven't hit yet. Is you know we've 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 had this speculative phase where none of these projects. Uh, really have any uh, real world use to deliver yet, um, and so you know we've seen this huge boom and bust. And I think the next you know real time we see any bull market is when a lot of these projects uh, you know actually start having these real world use cases come to light uh, and they see this use. And I think we've touched on that before uh, in, in you know those uh, calculations we were doing as far as the money coming in going out. We really need to see uh, we really need to see some real world use outside money coming in so well that, that, that's exactly it um quickly before we ask the last question i was just wondering you're into crypto you're on or you are on shark tank have you ever considered making not an ico kind of shark tank but like a shark tank just for crypto projects someone's working on that i've been invited to do one or two of those we'll, we'll see I, I don't have the time to do it myself i might join one of them okay cool that's cool. cool. Yeah. Well, um, we always end with this question, Vinny. Um, what's uh, what's one piece of advice that you would leave for beginners in the space? It's <laughs> for beginners. Um, uh, I'd say it's an observation. Um, Like when you lose fifty percent of your stash, 
you have to go double it to make, you know, you have to do 100% returns to get back to where you were. Just be careful. Like, I think people need to, people need to basically preserve capital. In a, so, in fact, here's a bit of advice. The trend is your friend in a bear market. Like, don't fight a bear market the same way you don't fight a bull market, right? Uh, so, play, you know, play the trends. Don't wait for, when the market turns and it goes bullish again, that's fine. But, you know, don't fall for the bull traps. Um, and, but until there's a, until we've actually turned around, I, I think, quite frankly, I think 12,000 is the level where things turn around and we go back into a bull market. So until we get back up above 12 and we're sustainably above 12, creeping up further and further, um, I think we're in a bear market for a while. And so, I, like, I, I, you know, be, be bearish when, be bearish in bear times and be bullish in bullish times. Because that. Fair enough. They get it. They get it. Well, Vinny, we appreciate you coming on the show. We appreciate you chatting with us. Uh, you've got tons and tons of insights. And, uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. Thanks, yeah. guys. It's Thanks for coming on, bro. It's a lot easier talking to you guys. Yeah, a lot easier talking to you guys than trying to do all this in 280 characters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we certainly uh, we certainly hope all the viewers enjoyed it. So I'm sure they did. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Oh, cheers. Appreciate it.